Hello everyone, welcome to my presentation about trauma and COVID-19. I would like to start off my presentation with a comment from Jenny Fisher, who is my favorite expert in the field of trauma. She says how a situation impacts a person is largely dependent on predisposing factors, such as the individual's past experiences, beliefs, perceptions, expectations, level of distress tolerance, values, and morals. Therefore, the purpose of my presentation is helping you to shed a light on the impact that this situation, COVID-19, might have had on your overall sense of well-being. This presentation will cover this outline, COVID-19 and new lifestyle, impact of COVID-19 on the rate of mental illness, definition of trauma, different types of trauma, common elements of trauma, trauma and brain, brain before trauma, brain after trauma, window of tolerance, mindfulness and window of tolerance, and also at the end I will give you some interventions and some other considerations. This pandemic has impacted our life in different ways, such as career, exercise, traveling, social gathering, education, family, and our internal experiences. Here, there are some statistics which were published by UBC Mental Health Department regarding the, the impact of COVID-19 on individuals who already were struggling with mental illness. They reported that people who already were struggling with mental illness twice more likely to say their mental health has declined due to COVID-19. They also three times more likely to be having trouble in coping. They four times more likely to have had suicidal thoughts and have tried to harm themselves. They are also 46% of them say that they are feeling depressed. Here are some more statistics um, which uh, were published by Canadian press regarding the, the impact of COVID-19 on Canadian people. They reported that 38% of Canadians say their mental health has declined due to COVID-19. 46% of Canadians feel anxious and worried. 14% are having trouble coping. 6% have developed suicide thoughts. 2% have tried to harm themselves in response to COVID-19. Also, it has shown harder for women. 44% of women's mental health versus 32% of men's mental health has got affected by COVID-19. Also, a new study suggests Canadian, especially women, will face a potentially explosive increase in mental illness for years after the COVID-19 pandemic is finally over. In next segment of my presentation, I'm going to give you some fundamental information about the impact of COVID as a collective trauma on our brain and body. Based on Jenina Fisher, who is an iconic expert in trauma field, traumatizing events can take a serious emotional toll on those involved, even if the event didn't cause physical damage. This can have a profound impact on the individual's identity, resulting in negative effects in mind, body, soul, and spirit. Here, I'm going to share with you some definition of trauma based on different experts in this field. Daniel Siegel believes that the traumatic events involve a single experience or enduring repeated or multiple experiences that completely overwhelm the individual's ability to cope or integrate the ideas and emotions involved in that experience. Based on Peter Levin, trauma is about loss of connection to ourselves, to our bodies, to our families, to others, and to the world around us. According to Tara Brock, 
trauma is when we have encountered an out of control frightening experience that has disconnected us from all sense of resourcefulness or safety or coping or love. There are common elements of trauma that are unexpected event that are beyond one's control and leaves us with a huge sense of insecurity and we are not prepared for that. There are two different types of traumas, large T trauma and small T trauma. Large T trauma such as natural disaster, terrorist attack, sexual assault, combat, car accident, or plane crash. And small T trauma, they are accumulative distressing event which are overwhelming but not often seen as traumatic. They are such as interpersonal conflict, infidelity, divorce, abrupt or extended relocation, legal trouble, financial worries or difficulty, or even COVID-19 can be considered as a small T trauma or collective trauma. This is the picture of our brain before trauma. A simple un understanding of the brain can help us to understand what happens when we are in distress or feeling overwhelmed and how we can respond to get this part of our brain working together again. Our brain has three main parts, each with different function. Thinking brain or frontal lobes use the verbal language and analytical reasoning. This part of our brain is responsible for problem solving language, regulatory abilities, reasoning, memories for events and facts. Emotional brain or limbic system or mammalian brain speaks the language of emotions. It's the place of our nonverbal, emotional or relational experience, feeling and gut memories. Lower part of our brain or brain stem or reptilian brain speaks the language of sensation and impulse survival mode. It's responsible for an instinctive responses, heart rate, breathing, and body temperature. This is the picture of our brain after trauma. The function and structure of our brain will be changed as a result of a real or perceived traumatic events, such as COVID-19, which has been considered a collective trauma by experts in this field and mental health professionals. Let's see how our brain will respond to a stressful event like COVID-19. When the event is out of our threshold of tolerance and overwhelms our nervous system, our prefrontal cortex of the brain shuts down. We get pushed out of our window of tolerance and our observing mind or thinking mind is no longer accessible. In other words, the connection between prefrontal cortex and emotional brain get disrupted. Therefore, we lose our ability to regulate our emotions, make decisions, be flexible, and use our moral reasoning. Then, amygdala triggers our past experiences, and danger cues get identified by amygdala. Then, amygdala sends a signal to survival brain or reptilian brain, and finally, reptilian brain reacts instinctively to the amygdala. When amygdala sends an alarm signal to this part, it triggers the sympathetic nervous system and correspondingly, it activates one of the brain's instinctive survival defense responses such as fight, flight, freeze, or faint. As a result, we experience muscles, tense, breathing, and changes in our heart rate. And if the event be perceived as a life-threatening, body can go to faint death mode. I would like to familiarize you with a very critical concept in the field of trauma, which is window of tolerance. An understanding of window of tolerance helps us to regulate our emotions 
by increasing our awareness and mindfulness. Window of tolerance is a term coined by Dr. Dan Stegel is not commonly used to understand and describe normal brain and body reaction in face of adversity such as COVID-19. The concept suggests that we have an optimal arousal level when we are within the window of tolerance that allows for the ebbs and flows, ups and downs of emotions which are experienced by human beings in everyday life. However, if an individual has an experience that overwhelms their nervous system, they jump out or feel pushed out of their window of tolerance on the upper, which is a hyper arousal state, or the lower, which is hypo arousal state of the brain. As I mentioned before, prefrontal cortex goes offline and just our emotional brain or reptilian brain they stay active therefore we lose our ability to think through actions and the consequences of our actions the summary of the impact of covid19 as a collective trauma is displayed in this lovely animation as you can see, when we are out of our window of tolerance on the upper side or hyper arousal state, our body's survival defense response will be either fight or flight. And when we are out of our window of tolerance on the lower side or hypo arousal state, our body's survival defense response will be either freeze or feign death. I use this slide to show you how you might feel and behave when you are out of your window of tolerance in fight, flight, freeze or faint death mode. When your body is in fight response, you experience anxiety, overwhelmed, chaotic responses, outbursts, anger, aggression and rage. When you are in your body is in flight response, you experience rigidness, obsessive compulsive behavior or thoughts, overeating or restricting addictions or in impulsivity. When your body is in freeze response, you feel disconnected, you are in autopilot, no display of emotion or flat, em flat emotions, you experience separation from self, feelings and emotions. And, and also when you are in feign death response, you feel dissociation, you are not present, you are unavailable, you are, you are shut down, and your memory, you experience memory loss. Last part of the presentation is about uh, some types of intervention. I'm going to give you some tools that would help you to, to bring yourself back to your window of tolerance or expand your window of tolerance and to be able to re-engage in life and re regulate your emotions. Mindfulness has shown the most effective intervention in widening our window of tolerance. Mindfulness engages and connects three main parts of the brain and help us to regulate emotions and create a sense of safety. It helps all parts of the brain work together as an integrated whole. The more you practice mindfulness, the more your brain will remember to engage all parts of the brain even under a stressful mindfulness. Thinking or observing brain can re-engage and calm down the amygdala by bringing mindful awareness to body and emotions. Limbic system or amygdala calms down. Stressful implicit memories that get triggered by danger lose strength and replace by positive adaptive memories and stops sending alarm signal to the reptilian brain. Our reptilian brain doesn't get alarm signal from amygdala anymore. Therefore, survival defenses get disengaged and social skills come back online. What is mindfulness? Mindfulness means being aware of body sensation, thoughts, images, memories, urges, and emotions 
as they are happening and adopting an attitude of curiosity and compassion. Some other benefits of developing our mindfulness or self-awareness is we can recognize when we are in our optimal zone of arousal or we are pushed into hyper or hypo arousal state. It helps us to relate to ourselves and others with kindness, warmth and compassion. It helps us to learn to respond rather than react to life challenges. It makes us more present and engaged in everyday life rather than being lost in our thoughts about the past or worried about the future. Here is an interesting intervention that was introduced by Russ Harris, an expert act therapist. He came up with say, face COVID acronym to help us to help ourselves to stay collected and centered and engaged in life, regardless of the pressure that pandemic has imposed on us. Here, I would like to explain to you the meaning behind each letter. As you can see, F stands for focus on what's in your control. That is, as you might have realized, we are not in control of our thoughts and feelings. Our behavior is the only thing that we can have control over. This entails that we are facing in our life. Russ Harris talks about drop anchor metaphor to teach us how to address our difficult experiences. He mentions when a big storm blows up, the boat in the harbor drop anchor because if they don't, they will get swept out to the sea. And of course, dropping anchor does not make the storm go away. C stands for come back into your body. It means that reconnect with your physical body. Some of the exercises that you can do to help you with that are, for instance, slowly push your feet hard into the floor or slowly st straighten up your, your back and spine. If you are sitting, sitting upright and forward. And the other one, for example, can be press your fingertips together and also you can stretch your arms and neck and shrug your shoulders and you can even slowly breathing. All of these exercises can help you reconnect with your body. E stands for engaging what you are doing. To do this, you can use one of these following exercises. You can look around the room and notice five things you can see. You can also notice three to four things that you can hear and notice what you can smell or taste and notice what you are doing. And at the end, you can give your full attention to the task or activity at hand. C stands for committed action. Committed action means effective action guided by your core values action you take because it's truly important to you. Action you take even if it brings up difficult thoughts and feelings for you. O stands for opening up. Opening up means making room for difficult feelings and being kind to yourself. Difficult feelings are exist as long as we are actually struggling with this crisis. Therefore, to be there, even though they really hurt. Also, treat yourself kindly. Remember that self-kindness is essential if you want to cope well with this crisis, especially if you are in a caregiver role. We stands for values. Your values might include love, respect, humor, patience, kindness, openness, and numerous others. Look for ways to integrate these values into your day. Let them guide and motivate your committed actions. I think as this crisis unfolds, there will be all sorts of obstacles in your life, goals that you can't achieve or things that you can't do, or problems for which there are no simple solutions. But you can still leave your values 
in a, a lot of different ways, even in the face of all of those challenges. Especially come back to your values of kindness and caring. Consider what are kind, caring ways that you can treat yourself and others as you go through this crisis. I stands for Identify Resources. Identify resources for help, assistance, support, and advice. This can include your friends, your family members, your neighbors, your health professional, emergency services, and also your social networks. Also, it can include psychological help if it's required. And finally, D stands for disinfect and distance physically. I'm sure you already know about that, but it's worth repeating. Disinfect your hands regularly and practice social distancing as much as possible for the greater good of community. And remember, we are talking about physical distancing, not cutting off emotionally. I would like to present you the Wheel of Emotions. It's helpful when you are acknowledging your emotions. It's said that we have six innate emotions. Fear, anger, happiness, sadness, surprise, and disgust. Within these basic categories, there are many nuances and intensities. Reflect on the range, range of emotions that you experience day to day using the chart as a guide to labeling them. Notice how you experience those emotions in your body and list some word that describe the physical sensation. Remember that we experience more than one emotion at a time, but focus on the one that is most prominent for you. You can also use Mindful Emotion Journal to acknowledge your emotions. There is a saying that if you name a thought or emotion, you can tame it. Turning towards difficult emotions can make them less intense and more manageable. Labeling helps us to step out of ruminating mind, notice what is happening in the present moment, and become more accepting of the full range of emotions. Research has found that the simple act of naming an emotion calms the emotional center of the brain. We can learn to ride the waves of intense emotions by developing language to label our emotions and by observing their intensity. Mindful journal is another tool that you can use in order to acknowledge your thoughts, feelings, and body sensation throughout the day. You can use a stop neck technique to help you pause throughout the day and recognize the emotions you are experiencing. S in acronym STOPS stands for stop and take a pause. T stands for take a breath. O stands for observe what you notice and P stands for proceed with the rest of your day. I hope this presentation has given you more insight into the nature of trauma and show you that there are proven tools available to help you navigate this crisis.